Well, welcome everybody. Episode 32 of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're doing well. And this one's a very special one. We're going to go live today, or we are live, to our Facebook page, which is Suspended Animation um, in Facebook. So welcome to everybody who's joining us live via that uh, page. But we've got a fantastic show today and a very interesting one, something that I'm fascinated about, and that's communication, but not always communication from a literal point of view. This is going to be all about the art and science of reading people. And we have none other than the expert, Alan Stevens. How are you doing, Alan? Pretty good, thanks, Aaron. How are you? Very, very well. And uh, we're going to be chatting all about how to communicate more effectively, how to read people. But uh, before we do that, I'll just introduce Alan for anybody who doesn't know who he is. Now, Alan Stevens is an international profiling and communication specialist who has worked with international clients, the likes of Disney Films and Gillette, and high profile organizations like the Australian Federal Police to help them to be able to understand how people tick. Alan now works with business owners and executives, helping them to understand and engage their clients and prospects, enhancing their presentations and negotiation skills, as well as with parents and teachers to help them enhance the ability of their children to reach their full potential while improving the experience of the parents, teacher and student. Alan's latest community initiative is called the Campfire Project. Now, the Campfire Project is a safe place for men and women to give themselves permission to tell their stories, to share their experiences and wisdom from around the world. This is his We Together initiative. So, as I mentioned, we're going to be chatting about effective communication that builds better relationships. So, welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here with you. Ah, I'm looking forward to this. I'm really, really fascinated by this, uh, by this topic. And, you know, ho hopefully you can, you'll be reading me at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share a little bit of that with the audience as we go along. Absolutely. But before we jump in, I thought, Alan, maybe just tell us a bit about who you are. Well, Alan Stevens, I'm a, um, as far as my personal life goes, I'm a grandfather, father of three sons, right. grandfather of five kids. Uh, one granddaughter and four uh, grandsons live in Newcastle here yep. in uh, New South Wales in Australia Beautiful. and I've been um, working with people all of my life as far as trying to understand how they tick and through a long uh, process has that finally led me through to reading faces. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> love it and um, did you study NLP or how did you get into that vein? A lot of different things. Firstly, where it all started for me, originally when I was 23 years old, I'd been working with um, the old PMG department, Postmaster Generals, which yep. had just become uh, telecom on the, um, the June of 1975 when I came up from Sydney to Newcastle, right. put in charge of a group of men who were all older than me, yep. and uh, I had to get them on site. Well, so that was my first introduction. My second in charge was uh, 38 and I'm 23 so 15 years difference Wow, cool! and so I had to get them on site so understanding them was a major target yep. and over the uh, 23 years in total that I was with telecom uh, by the time I'd left them it was the day they became Telstra right. and in that period of time I'd um, had a strong team that wanted to follow uh, me out of the organization when I took redundancy and in my mid uh, 30s my I joined the surf club and uh, did my bronze medallion and thought great I'm the same age as everybody else who were on the <laughs> committee when they asked me to get involved with the uh, committee I was a patrol captain and while I was uh, in that role they gave me everybody that no one uh, wanted and that's when I figured out why they got me to do that job so, became the patrol of the year and then I moved on to um, ask me to become club captain so as club captain and then zone supervisor of three beaches uh, I thought same age as everyone else, but everyone reminded me I'd been there five minutes and so now I'm the least experienced. <laughs> and did and you, then, growing up, were you, were you always good with people? Did you have an ability to read people or is this something that you developed? I was a loner. When I grew up, I went through a lot of bullying at school. So I spent most of my time on my own, right. more with my animals and anything else. Yep. And so well, I'll give you an idea of how uh, scared I was of uh, speaking to people. I was working at the age of 16 on the weekends at uh, Woolworths. And we had a big, huge manager. He was a big um, uh, German bodybuilder. 
Right. He asked me to come down to the front counter to see him, and uh, this is just before we opened. And I was so nervous, I passed out. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was scared of people <laughs> all the way through. Wow. So there was that. Uh, so virtually what I do today, anybody can do. If I could learn it through what I went through, yep. anybody can do what I do. Fantastic. And hopefully you have no one passing out during the course. That's exactly right. <laughs> it, uh, I have uh, been in front of an audience. I uh, had to give a speech where I, um, I passed out there as well when I was in oh my, my 30s. So wow. the whole thing is you'll get a lot of challenges through life. But one of the things I realized, just keep stepping up to them, step through them and uh, keep moving forward. Absolutely. You know, you get better every time you do something. So you That's just it. practice, take the knocks on the chins and move forward. That's all you can oh, do. definitely. Absolutely. So um, before we get right into it, I just kind of want to go broad to start with and maybe get your understanding from a holistic point of view of what is the definition in your mind of effective communication? Well, effective communication, it's, we think that it's talking to the other person, but really it's listening to them. Right. As we always hear people say, we've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion. Yep. And I go, that even isn't uh, the full story either. You've got two eyes, two ears and one mouth. Oh, like use it. them in that proportion. I like because it. It's not just listening to the person, but it's also observing the nonverbals. Yep. You know, the body language, the, uh, the little twitches or micro expressions are on the face that tell you that person's true personality. Yep. And it's not so much trying to get your message across, it's trying to understand the other person so you can then be able to relay what they need to know in the way that they want to be spoken to. And that's Beautiful. where the true uh, meaning of communication comes in. Beautiful. So it's not about influencing in a way or um, convincing. It's more about understanding what they need to help them make a decision or decide right. what they want to do. So if you separate the first, the two statements you made there as far as influencing and uh, you know, taking them into a place where they follow what you want them to do. Yeah. Yes, we want to influence them, but the best way to influence them is to understand them fully, know what they need, then present it in a way in which that influences them to buy from you or to accept you, whatever, the, you know, if you're looking at a personal relationship, yep. you're looking for that special person in your life. Yep. By the way, that's probably the biggest sale that you'll ever have, <laughs> trying to sell <laughs> yourself that they should spend the rest of their life with you. Absolutely. But in that process, it's a case of being able to fully understand them, let them see who you are, and that you are able to fulfill whatever the need they, that is that they have, whether that be in sales or personal relationships. Wow. So you basically specialize in reading people from a holistic point of view. So you don't, you don't exclude what people say, but you oh, put it in not. conjunction no. with mm. reading their body language, reading their facial features, mm. um, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, well, we, they talk about in communication, 100% of communication, we've got words, we've got the body language, we've got the, the tone of voice. Yep. So we've got the words they say are worth about 7%. Wow. The tone of voice, 38, the body language, 55. And people go, oh, therefore the words aren't that important. When it's on the phone, people can't see you, but the body language transfers into the tone of voice. But the words go up to about 17%. People say, well, still, that's not a lot. But you try having a conversation with just... Uh, you know, tones of voice and body movements, yeah. sitting there grunting, nobody's going to understand just the words are just as important, but the amount of information you can read from them, the real truth of the situation is in the body language and the tone of voice and all the other non-verbals that you can see. That's actually really interesting. So it depends on the medium um, mm. with which you're using. But if I throw in now, obviously now everybody's gone virtual. Has that changed the relationship uh, to a degree in terms of, you know, uh, visual, verbal and body language? Well, if we're able to get a clear connection like we've got at the moment on, uh, on Zoom here, I can pick up all those new little nuances, those little twitches, et cetera, that may come up. So yeah. it's the same as being in the, in the, in the room with you. Yeah. Okay. The only thing is that slight difference that we have when we feel like we're not connected to that person because we're not in the same physical space. Gotcha. But as far as the, the uh, uh, ratio of the words, the body language, the tone of voice, they'll still be at that 7%, 38%, 55%, gotcha. as I mentioned Perfect. before. Perfect. But uh, if we're on to uh, then back to the phone, well, then that's going to be the same. Or if we're using the internet without video, same as a phone, it'll be the 17% for the words. That's right. And then if you go throw in text in there, oh my God, it's just word. That's mm. all it is. Yep. That's it. Well, if you look at text, that's where we make most of our mistakes. And I'm glad 
the one thing that's coming out of the coronavirus is that people are starting to use social media in the way it should have been used. We're getting more social, we're getting more, well, we might be physically um, uh, separated from everybody, isolated, yep. but we are more uh, the, um, of, uh, socially connected than we've ever been before. I haven't yeah. spoken to as many people online or even in a week that I have now today as I'm going online all the time. Absolutely. I agree. So, the same. And the relationships have about a much better conversations. Yep. So we are focusing on the other people because we have that need to connect. We're disconnected and now we're able to connect in that way, which is causing us to behave differently. Yep. yep. So we, people should be able to pick up the body language expressions a lot easier because we're now focused on getting that connection, which we weren't focused on before. Before. Yep. Too true. Very so We relied on text in say Facebook uh, posts and things like that. Yep you can't pick up the, um, uh, the tone of voice in the text because it's just straight text. Yeah. You can't pick up where the, the emphasis is on a, in a word or a sentence. Are they emphasizing one word, are they emphasizing another? Because that'll change the whole meaning of the, of the text. That's true. And, and actually, that's a really good point that you bring up. I mean, I suppose with what you know and with what you understand about how different means of communication influence different people, there might be some times where you might not want to do face to face because it might actually cause too much uh, nuance. Whereas if you do it via text or via email, it might get, might give you the, the um, uh, outcome you want more, you know, in, with an optimum potential. Interesting. I'm just throwing it out there. It depends on uh, how you write that uh, text and who you're writing to. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you an example of uh, one of my clients the other week was just saying that, he had a, a, a client that he'd been working with that finished the uh, project, but the client wouldn't pay the full invoice. Mm -hmm. He only wanted to pay part of it. He was using the coronavirus situation as a reason why he couldn't. Right. And he'd also put off the next project saying, oh, we can't do that until if, if we do it at all until after the coronavirus is over. Okay. So I was able to look at the, uh, the guy's face, told him how this man liked to uh, think and process, told him how to go back and talk to him, and then told him how to write the text Yep. in a way in which it would connect with him. And the end result, he's paid the full um, invoice and he's started the next project already. Fantastic. C effective communication. It's fascinating. That's what it comes down to. It all comes down to the more you understand the other person, know how they like to think and process, and you talk to that, yep. or if it's just text, then you write to that. The end result is you're going to have a much better connection with them every time. It reminds me of uh, a book that I've read. My father first gave me the most famous book, How to Win Friend, Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Yep. One of my absolute favorites. And in the initial editions, he goes uh, through a lot of detail in how he writes, the words he uses, the way he deals with people. And that probably rings true with a lot of what you're saying as well, in terms of how you script things. Mm. And that's right. Of course, with... Uh uh, Dale, what he, it was all about how do I connect with somebody in the right way. So he would use a respectful way of writing. Yep. He would still be able to put his power across in the text, yep. but he made that initial connection first. So in writing, he was doing what we're all trying to do all the time, which is create a relationship. Because yep. nobody does anything with you if they don't know, like, and trust you. Yep. And that trust is based on the relationship you can build. So... When I hear people say that um, oh, I've got to work on my business relationship and I know that uh, Bill Gates recently had said that one thing that he didn't think of when he was in uh, Microsoft, a question he wouldn't have asked himself, but he does now, is what, um, he, what are his uh, business relationships like? Is he cultivating those? Yeah. But even he got it wrong because there is no such thing as a business relationship. Businesses don't talk to each other. People in the businesses talk to each other. That's right. You, know, you might have a business where it's business to business, you might be in a business where you're business to customer, B to C. Yep. At the end of the day, that's where your market avatar sits, but your market avatar is a human being. So everything we do in this world is H to H, human to human. Yep. I was about to say P to P, people to people, mm. <laughs> person it. to person. Absolutely. Mm. I love it. Yeah, take them to the next level from the people and put them into a human characteristic and try and be a bit more human with them. Yep. I like that. It's very, very nice. And so why is it that we don't teach this stuff at school? Well, at school, the major focus is, and I'll probably get uh, uh, attacked here by some of the teachers, but I'm <laughs> not having a go at the teachers here because our system is wrong. It was designed originally to get us off the farms where we only spent a few hours a day because we'd get out of the heat in the middle of the day, we'd rest. Yep. We couldn't work while we're waiting for the, um, uh, the, the plants to grow, the crops to grow. Yep. So 
but then they were trying to educate us to go into the mines and into the factories. So we had to be educated to go into longer hours of work. Right. So that's what the education system was about all the way through. And it's still today creating uh, or bringing our children through so that they can then fulfill a job role. Yep. But nobody is working on helping them to find a job role that fits their personality. True. Because if they did that, they'd be happier at school. They'd be uh, happier when they went to work. They wouldn't be doing uh, uh, careers at, uh, or courses at TAFE and university that they end up never using and end up with a hex deck for it. Yeah. But they, and domestic violence and other things wouldn't be as high. And I know that the latest uh, Gallup research was saying that 87% of people in the workplace are disengaged. Wow. That's across that's the Western incredible. world. That's incredible. And that's, people don't want to be there. So yeah. in the education system, what we do is we teach subjects. It's rote learning. We don't do problem-based learning mm -hmm. or experiential learning where we teach the kids how to think. So once they know how to think, they never have to learn a subject ever again. That's right. Because they can reason everything for themselves. Yeah. And but we don't, themselves. and I don't have a, you know, putting teachers down here because they're dealing with 20, 26, 30 kids at a time. And they've got a, a job they've got to get through in a certain period of time. It's hard to treat everybody as an individual. Sure, yeah. The system so is I've, built for I've the got masses. a solution for them on that one, though, if they want to talk to me. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so tell us a bit more about how we can improve our communication and a bit more about exactly what you do. Well, explain uh, what I do first of all, then. It's your facial features. They virtually tell me your personality. So all I need is your photograph. I can see you on Facebook, LinkedIn, or anywhere else. And if people go, well, that sounds a little bit woo-woo, a little bit esoteric, well, and it's about well, phrenology, which was an old belief that certain face shapes would be criminals and things like that. Yeah. That's based on character, but I'm talking about your personality. If you lift weights, you're going to build muscles up. We also know that if you, whatever you feel inside, you're going to express outwardly. That's why the expressions work. That's why body language works. Yeah. So if you repeatedly, repeatedly think in a certain way, you're going to build ridges and, cre ridges and crevices on your face in particular ways. And that tells me the history of how you like to think and process. Wow. So once I've got that, then I know how to speak to you. I know how much information to give you. I know in what order it needs to be given to you. Gotcha. And then when I'm speaking to you, I've now got the uh, body language and the expressions to tell me whether I've read you right, whether there's something you might be trying to conceal like emotional issues. Yep. And at the very tail end, uh, whether you're uh, lying. Gotcha. So, wow. I mean, some people use the micro expressions to detect if somebody's a liar, so they're lie detectors. Uh, I'm more of a truth seeker. I want to understand who you are as a person, how you're feeling and everything else so that I can build the strongest relationship with you, so that I can help you the best, and that way I know what's the best thing that I can actually do for you out of all the different things that I can do. Wow. So, I mean, I'm sure everybody out there is thinking, all right, Darren, you've got to ask this question. So, Alan, read me. Read my facial features and my crevices and whatnot. Okay. Well, number one is the first thing I look at is how much space you need when I meet you for the first time. I know that you're fairly affable, but I also know that you like to stand back a little bit to check people out when you meet them for the first time. Okay. That's not so much that you're not friendly. It's the fact that you're more discerning. You want to see who's safe and who's not safe to be around. And how did you, how did you ascertain that? This one's in the height of the, uh, the eyebrows themselves compared to the, where the eyes are, the gap is between that, is that right? the size of that. Now, when I measure it, I look straight through the pupil because everyone's got different shaped eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. I will look straight through the pupil <laughs> and look for the height of the iris compared to the gap above it. Unbelievable. And if it's a large gap, I know that you need um, space when you, you meet people for the first time. And by the way, on these traits, there's no right uh, trait, there's no wrong trait, there's, and every trait's got an upside and a downside. Yep, yep. The upside is that you stand back from people, which means you might seem to be a little bit less friendly, but people yep. will, but you'll know who's safe to be around. Once okay. you've got to know somebody, you're as friendly as anybody else. Love it, yep. Whereas somebody like me, who's very low set, I go and make friends with everybody, and the downside of that is I can be making friends with the wrong person gotcha. and not know it. Gotcha, yep, I'd have to say you're right. I'm a little... I'm friendly, but I'm always cautious initially. That's it. So, and then I notice if I'm going to start talking to you, I know that you like the, the big picture, the overview. If you're on a mountain peak and there's another mountain peak, you want to know, how can I bridge across here? What's the quickest way to get there? Yep, that's true. Whereas somebody who's a little bit more like me, who's analytical, I want to go know if it's worth going over this. I'm going to go down into the valley and check out on the way and make sure that that's where I want to be. Right. 
But then I know once you've got the information you need to make a decision, it just get out of the way, give me the best way to do it and, gotcha. and, and let me get it done. So, so you, you're straight So you that. don't waste too much time on the details when you know that's all you need. That's it. Yeah. Because in most cases, that's all you, you need. If I, and somebody who's analytical, they'll take a lot more time. And I'll be telling them most of the time, on most of the things you do in a day, you don't need to be that analytical. Gotcha. But if it came to health and money, things like that, then I'd be saying to you on those items, slow down and yep. think a little bit more before you jump in. Yeah. And how did, you, how did you read that part of, of my personality? Well, that is in the exposure of the eyelids and the length of the, mouth, of the face down here compared to the overall height. So the big picture is in the exposure. Yep. So the, if you notice with mine, there's a fold of skin and... The eyes actually go underneath that fold of skin or right, close yeah. to it, yeah, which yeah, means yeah. I'm analytical. Okay. You've got the lines above and there's a big gap between the right. eyelash and that <laughs> fold of skin. And, so, and is, is this stuff, like, are we born like this or what happened? Are, are our personalities molded and therefore yeah. our facial features change or how does that work? Well, there's a combination of things. In uh, the psychologist in Texas did that, what they call the Texas Adoption Trials where they had all the children that they were, had been adopted, they knew their natural mother, and in some cases the father, yeah. but they also knew, you know, of course, the, the people who ado adopted them. Right. And they profiled the uh, kids at the age of seven and also at the age of 17. This was over a 30-year period they were doing this. Right. And they found that those children, where they, the um, uh, biological parents, there were a lot of similarities to the biological parents where they weren't similar to their um, adopted parents. Gotcha. And so they realized that, and there's been a debate in psychology because of all the different types of psychology of nature and nurture. Yes. So nature being what we're born with, the DNA, and nurture our response to our environment. Yeah. So it proved in the testing that they were doing, it's a combination of both. There were certain traits that were passed down from the parents, and then there were certain traits that we developed in response to our environment. So in a newborn child, there are certain traits that will be passed down. You can start to read those in the face. Wow. As a child gets older, they become more obvious and then you start to see the, the um, uh, nurture traits that start to develop as well from their wow. response to their environment. So it will change. You know, with the eye, people say, oh, but I get old, you know, the folds of skin start coming out down over the eyes, but you'll find a lot of elderly people who are still quite exposed and you go, okay, why did those other ones have them come down? Have a look at the work they've been doing. They've been doing this and focusing. So they, you know, it's muscle action. Yep. So if we keep pulling the muscles down, then that will change. Yep. I had a, a bad habit when I was growing up of always doing this, pulling <laughs> while I was thinking. <laughs> now you end up with a turkey neck if you're not <laughs> careful. And so anything that muscle that we move over and over, we're going to develop. And that's all this is. Now if we look at the closeness of the eyes for someone who's really focused or somebody who's a little bit more laid back, easier more to, uh, to be distracted oh there goes a squirrel type thing yep, yep. it's in the position of the eyes if you're really focused the eye sockets large the muscles around that are what hold your eyes in place and if you work it where you're focusing like this that's the movement of the muscles right and right. so now the muscles take that permanent shape right. so now i mean all this stuff is really talking about the analyzing the physical features and the ratios mm. and the space and whatnot do you also bring in NLP and analyze where I look and where, which way my eyes move and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, because this is how it comes into, because as I said, the picture, the facial features, you now that image you've got will tell me your personality. But now I've got to communicate with you and know how whether I've read you right or not. So this is where the NLP can come in. I can just know, right, first of all, that you like just the overview. So if there's a lot of information I've got to give you, I'd be saying, look, Darren, there's a lot of information in here, but what I'm going to do is give you the overview first. And then you can ask the questions that you want to ask. And I'm sure you're going, Phew, I'm not going to be inundated with I comments. Love it. I love it. And then I go, but if there's something there that I have to tell you that I think is important, it's all right if I tell you that then. Beautiful. And, See, that, that would work perfectly for me. That's, yeah. that's me to a T. And then so straight away, that's how I start that conversation. So now I look at the format from the other traits, how formal the, the language needs to be. I know you've got a dry sense of humour, so we'll have a fairly <laughs> laid back conversation. We can quit about things. I don't have to worry about, too worried about being politically correct on the things that I say. Very true. I mean, if, I, if you throw anything at me, I know you're going to throw it back at me as well. So it's going to be <laughs> light hearted. Like so that. then I know what language to use, but then taking the NLP to a deeper level again, you then know how to steer the conversation by 
causing you to think in particular ways to get your thought processes going. So you start to look at other possibilities that you've worked out for yourself. Right. Yeah. But that's when the body language and the expressions come in because now I've got the feedback. It's just, just how accurately I've read you. Yep. Love it. And exactly how you feel about the way I've been talking to you. Unbelievable. That's fact. You mean you've summed me up to a T in about <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> But when you, when, when you work with people and teach them these, these skills and these tools, how do you do that? Does it take a long time or what's the process? It depends on who I'm teaching. I've put together recently a, um, a short course for school teachers and parents. There's, right. As I say, when I look at the facial features, I work with up to about 68 traits at the moment. There's a few more that we're looking at. But there are three traits in a young child, which together on the combination, quite often the major issue as to why a lot of kids have been labelled with ADHD when they haven't got that, they just don't fit the system. Uh -huh. But if you can read those, you know how to talk to the child. That course is online, it's self-paced, and it, um, by the time you've not only done the course but also read yourself and the child and you know, got the download sheets, got an idea around it, it takes you an hour to do. Wow. I've got a mask. You know, at the other end I have or courses in the way of, of different speeds and different lengths in between. So my master program, which you learn all of the expressions, the facial features, the body language. You know, we talk about the NLP, how to use all of that. That's a three month program, depending on um, uh, the time frame that the person has. Gotcha. Perfectly. And I love what you said. You actually mentioned in there, and this is something that I think is really important, is that all these tools and strategies help us to read ourselves. Mm. as well as everybody else. I think yeah. that's really important. You know, a lot, a lot yeah. of people would forget that. We can use this on ourselves. That's it, because let's face it, you have an impression of who you are and everybody else has an impression of themselves as well. That's right. But nobody's looking for our, through our eyes when they look at us. Yes. They're looking through their eyes. Yep. So we need to know how the world sees us. So that's why whenever I teach people how to profile somebody else, I go, you have to know yourself first, then you learn how to read the other person, and now you know where you are on the world continuum. Yep. You know where that person sits on that particular trait. And now you know how to change the way you like to be spoken to, to match the way they want to be spoken to. Love it. Love it. And obviously you have to adapt um, your skill set and your tools when you're working in business environments or in personal environments or in, mm. you know, with kids or different ages and whatnot. That's it. You know, you're still reading the traits the same, but you change the, the style of the language. If you're talking to a young child and you know that you're trying to get them to understand they're feeling uh, lost and all the rest of it, especially with homeschooling, they haven't got the teacher there and the parents struggling trying to teach them. Well, there's a different way in talking to the child yep. who has that, those particular traits. They would be different to an executive yeah. in a boardroom where you're trying to put forward an idea of something that they should be following, yeah. or if you're actually their senior officers, talking to them and getting them to do something for you. Right. Yep. So everything's relative. Yep. And I can imagine you, you trained a lot of salespeople in the past. Uh, everything from salespeople. Uh, my clients have included Disney Films and Gillette for their uh, Rogue One Star Wars launch in uh, London. Yep. I was hired to go over there for that. I've been wow. training the federal police over a couple of different years. Wow. Uh, I've worked with businesses of all sizes and as I said, now with parents and school teachers. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'd love to have like hear a case study or, or something, you know, give us a nice example of how you took somebody that really was struggling in that area and gave them incredible tools that allowed them to succeed in whatever they were doing quite quickly. Well, I had a gentleman who was doing my master program and in the early weeks of it, he pointed out that he in commercial buildings, and he'd quoted on the first building and he'd quoted $2 million on this building. The clients wouldn't go above 1.6 million right. and conversation was just getting worse and worse. And he says, it's falling off the table. I've lost the deal. Yep. And I said, well, first of all, tell me how you've been talking to them. And while you're doing that, show me their faces. <laughs> so we're on zoom. Yep. He you know, found their faces on uh, the internet, yep. shared his screen with me. <laughs> and I said, right, well, the one you're talking to about the money, I said, he's the senior part. He said, yes, he is. I said, stop talking money with him. Right. This is the first of a number of buildings. The first one, it's got to be, well, it's got to be schmick. It's got to be perfect because this is a flagship. And this guy is all about receiving service. He's a guy who would go in and he'll pay, as I say, through the nose for all the ambience, for the right treatment and everything else. You go into a, cap, a restaurant, big price tags on the, on the plate, 
the plate's huge, but the food's really tiny, but the waiters, the, you know, the reputation of the place and all the rest of it, he would pay for it. So I said to him, talk to him about the service of how important this building is, that it has to be spot on yeah. because that's determined on whether they're going to be successful with the other buildings and the other outlets. And he said, well, his business partner though, he is about the money, but he's also, his facial features are showing me he likes to start jobs and finish them quickly. He doesn't like doing long-term ones. Wow. So with him, talk about how by getting the first one finished, you'll be able to then work on the next one faster. They'll get all their projects finished faster. But the beautiful part of it is as they finish them quicker, they'll get more and more people in. So they'll be making money faster. So he hit both of his two major traits in that one conversation. He added another 150, because by the time they finished, talked about what they really wanted in the building. He'd add another $150,000 to his original quote and signed them off on it. What do you know? And you read this just from a static photograph. Just from image. a static photograph. Just from facial features. That's all that was required. Unbelievable. <laughs> because the face is really, a, the, it's a history of how you like to think and, uh, and process. As they say, the eyes are the windows to the soul, but your facial features are the windows to your mind, how you like to think. And I can only imagine what this can do for the dating process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've, first oh online course I put up was called um, Smart Online Dating. Well, yeah. I decided to do online courses <laughs> and I put it under the, um, uh, the banner of how to avoid the psychopath and other practical dating tips. <laughs> Love it. So, but and it's really nothing more than a, um, a relationship course. It's, you know, I used to teach people how to go to someone's LinkedIn page, look at their photograph, look at what they've written about themselves and know within that instant whether that person could do what they said they could do. Right, yep. And go to somebody, you know, just move on to the next person if you're looking for someone to provide a service or you're looking to hire somebody. And so all it was was taking that training to that next level, which was saying, is that person on a dating site, that photograph you've seen and what they've said about themselves, are they who they really said they are? Wow. Yep. But then not, not only that, when you do find the right, right partner, how do you keep them? That's, because that's the, the traits thing. that attract you will quite often be the ones that will frustrate you later on because every trait comes with an upside and a downside. Say for instance, you have aesthetic appreciation, which you do, which is about how it feels inside. And you've got a partner who has got the opposite trait, which is more about dramatic appreciation. They like to express outwardly. Oh, they're exciting. <laughs> oh, but when yeah. they over a period of time when they do stress up down they're like drama queens yeah, yeah. it drives us nuts <laughs> so it. both you and i who have the aesthetic appreciation we pull back yeah. and now we think that they've changed well they haven't we've just got used to the fact that all that euphoria and uh, lust that was there in the, in the first part now has been sort of replaced with what we're noticing in the downside of their traits but if you know straight away that that's just the way they need to behave, that's how they express themselves, you can go, that's fine. And you can let them do that and you don't have an issue with it. Gotcha. Well, you, know what, you, you, you know what you're like, getting yourself into straight away. That's it. And where you and I would both, we've got pressure, we're going to pull back into our cave. We have to fix it. Yep. You know, leave us alone. If your partner's got the dramatic appreciation and they say to you, we've only got to ask two questions. Number one, because the first thing is they're worried about, is it them? Right. Yep. You know, they start imagining stuff and with all this dramatic appreciation, they just build it up. Yep. All I've got to do is ask, Darren, is it, is there anything to do with me? No, it's not. Right. Is there anything I can help you with? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. They know that this is the way you need to process. You need to you know, go into your quiet cave, fix the problem. And then you come out and they go, okay, I know you need to work on things. So I'm going to leave you alone to do that. But when you're ready, come and talk to me. Gotcha. Now, right. because they've given you that space and they also left the door open for you to go and talk to them. I guarantee that you'll fix it and go back and talk to them sooner and say to them, thanks very much. Gotcha. So it's even working within that framework to make sure your relationships are stronger and that's you it. understand each other. In that's, more detail. that's just one trade out of that's 68 we can work on. One trade out of 68. Mm. Wow. And the 68 span personal, professional, everything, or do you, you break them up? Yep, because it tells you how they like to think and process and you'd look at it and go, right, well, if we look at the dramatic appreciation, right. we know that that person likes to be on stage along with some other traits that they like to express themselves. Yep. Well, they're going to be a lot of fun out in public. And, you know, uh, they're going to parties and things, but then we turn around and go, okay, what are they going to be like in business? Well, if you're in a design area, yep. you, know, you need somebody who's a bit more expressive and things like that, so they would fit into that role. Gotcha. 
But if they're doing counseling work where there's a lot of emotional stuff going on, you go, oh, they're probably better off not in that role, put them in another one. Because this is not about the trait being right or wrong. It's about knowing yourself, yeah. knowing where your strengths are, and then go and work in that the, in you know, careers that give you that ability right. to work with those strengths. It's about fit. As opposed it's to where we were at school. Where do you fit best? Yeah, because at school we were, if you were good at something, did you do extra work on that or did you do extra work on the stuff you were bad at? No, the stuff that yeah. you're good at, of course. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what we wanted to do, but I was bad at math, so I got kept after school, and I had to do a lot more in math. So I had to, any area I was bad in, I got kept back. Gotcha. So they were working on improving my weaknesses, so I could be the same as everybody else, or sit yeah. a, a particular level at what they wanted. Yeah. However, who employed? Who was going to employ me for uh, my weakness? They were looking for my strengths. That's right. They were not interested. So, they wouldn't employ you for your mathematics ability. They'd employ you for the other strengths. Yeah, they'd, they'd look for the other skills that I actually have. Yep. And so, yeah, my things were, I've got high hand dexterity. I was good with my hands, yep. tech drawing, things like that. So they were the jobs that I should have gone into. Not a, you're not going into it, becoming an accountant. I couldn't yeah, think of anything worse. But for an accountant, someone who's got those features, they love that work. Thank you. Because that's where teams come from. They'll do the stuff I don't want to do. And if I know who they are, then I can push that stuff across the table to them. Yep. And hopefully the stuff that they don't like doing is what I want to do. Love it. And so this is how you build your teams, by people who are being different, not the same. Beautiful. Beautiful. So there's so many things that we can take out of this. Personal relationships, raising your children, whether it be sales, negotiations. Yep. You know, Maintaining are, relationships, business or personal. That's it. Whatever. Yeah, see, I, as I say to people, I've got a very narrow niche. But instead of it being vertical in one field, it's horizontal yeah. and it sits underneath everything. Because if you think about relationships, it's a little bit like the footings underneath a concrete slab. Yeah. You put the concrete slab on the ground and you put all your building and everything on top of it, but you haven't anchored that slab. Sooner or later, the slab's going to move and the building's going to crumble. Yeah. It's the foundation. The foundations, the footings that go into the ground, they're the thing that hold it still. Yep. And you've got to dip, put those down really deep, especially if you've got a lot of frosts and things like that. They get underneath the slab, lift yeah. it, yep. troubles happen. And this was a thing leading up to uh, the coronavirus. Most people didn't work on the emotional intelligence. They didn't work on their relationships. Yep. And that's why the bulk of them are struggling now and why 87% of people were disengaged before we even moved into uh, the coronavirus. That's right. And so they were already at a disadvantage because... People just don't put the um, emphasis on what you can't see because it's intangible, the emotional right. intelligence. Yep. So when they say to me, well, what do I bring to the table? My only answer to that is I bring the table. <laughs> and you put all your stuff on top of it. And I make sure that <laughs> table has got four legs that are holding onto the ground. Gotcha. It can't go anywhere. I make sure it's balanced and everything else. <laughs> I love it. I bring the table. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Alan, I want to just jump in, in two, a minute or so, I want to jump and talk a bit about the Campfire Project, which is such a, an amazing initiative. But before we do that, I mean, without people going and doing your course just yet, which I definitely advocate that they go and do and explore that with you, if, you, if people want to be aware of one or two little things that they can use, a little tip or trick that they might be able to use in reading people or in, for better communication, is there anything that you can give people to implement straight away? Exactly. And let's make it a little bit easier for them. They don't have to go away and remember it after I've spoken here. Right. I'll give you a link to a free resource, which is looking at three of the uh, particular traits. It talks about the secrets, to, seven secrets to reading people. Right. It has the three um, uh, traits that you can read in someone's face. It goes into the micro expressions and how to read those. Yeah. It's a six uh, emails over 11 days. Yep. You sign up for them. You don't go in my mailing list. If you want to go in my mailing list, you've got to opt back in. Gotcha. But this gives you some tips you can play with. And so over the next two weeks, they can have quite a bit of fun with that. And I'll give All you right. that link. To put Fantastic. In there. I'll be signing up to that one. <laughs> um, now, I want to chat a bit about the Campfire Project. So maybe, you know, it's something that I don't know a lot about, but we're going to discuss in more detail uh, in another time. But tell me a bit about, tell the viewers and the audience a bit about the Campfire Project. Well, we know that um, at the moment, a lot of men just don't know their role in, their, in the workplace. They don't know their role in the family. Uh, we're trying to be more emotional. You know, men are more about uh, the compassionate empathy. We want to fix things. Yep. And all of a sudden, we had to get into the emotions and you know, just lost. Yep. We looked at uh, girls. Well, yes, girls have the other women. There's, they still have their rite of passage to a degree. But boys don't have that anymore. And we've got boys... In, well more than about 50% of families 
the father is absent, either not there physically or so involved in their work that they were absent anyway emotionally. Yep. Now we've got a bit of a challenge for them because now they're at home and they've completely disconnected at this stage and it's making it even more pressure on men. So we've got more men now who are more suicidal and depressed than they ever were before. Yeah, wow. So where we made a boss 70 something people here in Australia with coronavirus, we're losing uh, people who are committing uh, uh, suicide daily in Australia. It's eight people a day. And 75% of those, six of them out of the eight are males. So we have this death rate. So I realized a long time ago, we needed a safe place. First of all, where men could come along and tell their stories. But I needed to make sure it was a place that not only just for men to go into a, a men's group and you know, feel good in there. What happened when you come out? It's like at school, we learn all these subjects, but we don't know how good we are until we go out in the field and we actually apply what we've learned. So I thought, right, with the Campfire Project, first of all, was a safe place for men to come in and tell their stories, giving themselves permission to do that. And then I brought them in to doing one-on-one -on -one chats like this with Zoom, yep. and then letting everybody else in the campfire see those and making sure the trolls couldn't get in at all. Yep. Then I started bringing the men into panel discussions. So there'll be four of us on screen talking about issues affecting boys and men. Wow. And it was all about bringing boys into manhood and helping good, good men to become better men. Right. What the men didn't realise was I had some women in there from day one. <laughs> then I started letting more women coming in. And people, um, they were, it was a test to see if the women would be respectful to the men, which they were. But once we started the panel discussions, the women couldn't help themselves. They were sending me personal messages going, never heard men talk like this. We love it. We want to get involved because we want to talk to these men. Wow. So I started doing one-on-ones with the women and we've got them in the panel discussions now. Incredible. Because we had Me Too and Men Too. Me Too came out in 2003 because of all the abuse towards women. Yep. Then in 2018, the uh, Men Too movement came out to compensate for some of the uh, false accusations that were being made by some of the women in the Me Too movement. Yeah. So I realised that both of those groups, yes, they fix problems today, but their solutions today are the problems of tomorrow. So the Campfire Project is under the hashtag I created, We Together, so that men and women standing together, shoulder to shoulder, having discussions, looking at issues and working them out together. Fantastic. And so it's got um, a bit over a thousand, about 1,020 people in there so far. Yep. I've um, interviewed the best part of 110 already. <laughs> um, and we've had uh, over 60 panel discussions. We've got... Um, one of the ladies in there, Angela Heiser, now is um, doing some one-on-ones and about to start doing panel discussions. Great. I've got Scott Carson, a young fellow down in Melbourne, who's doing Facebook Lives on Thursday night. Wow. And bringing four people in, having panel discussions in there. So this thing moves very quickly away from being my tribe to our community. And it's brought uh, men's groups and women's groups from all over the world together. Amazing. And partnerships between men and women in uh, building uh, new uh, concepts and ideas to uh, it, improve our planet. Has it been picked up by the press or by any international bodies or organizations? Or, uh, you know, anything uh, well, it's um, a little bit cynical here because uh, it's a good news story. Right. And good news stories don't really sell the news. You'll notice that, yes, you hear some good news stories today, but it's only a couple of minutes in a three hour segment true, of true. news. Yep. So, but, um, and I know it's going to be a bit of a challenge because there was a lot more talk when I think it was named uh, Bettina Arts came out. She started defending men because of the women's movement really having an attack at them. Yeah. So she copped a lot of flack from them. So there's a lot of stories in that of the arguments between the two sectors. It's like warring tribes. Yeah. <laughs> to have another body come along and go, well, we don't fight with anybody. If you don't, we don't agree with you. I'm going to ask you, why do you feel that way? How can I um, understand you? So you explain to me. And in that conversation, I'll either get a new view, you might realise that, hey, my view is better, yep. or we both uh, agree to keep our own, uh, own views and respect each other for that. Yep. We agree to disagree in a way. Yep. Yeah. So that's the way the group's been uh, working. And um, uh, the, the men and women who have come together and the, the chats they're having, it's just been, it's blown my mind of how uh, well it's taken off. Fantastic. And so how do people access the Campfire Initiative? How do we watch it? How do we see it? Where do we find well, out about it? The biggest it? way to find it is find my uh, page because I advertise all the talks that we're doing in there. Okay. So you have to come into the group to see the talks. But I've put a few of the, some of the people have been, 
been on the one to ones. They've done little testimonials, so three or four, you know, two or three, four minutes. They're out there for people to see. But it's called the Campfire Project. It's a um, uh, what do you call it? A, a Facebook group. Facebook group, okay. And I've been putting uh, ads out on it in LinkedIn and other places. So if anybody looks at my social media, yep. it's uh, all over the place. <laughs> Fantastic. So the Campfire Project on a on group Facebook. in Facebook. That's the That's uh, it. beautiful. And um, in terms of finding more about you and your services in terms of communication and reading people and your courses, how do people access those? Well, the quickest way to have a look and find out more about me is to look at my website, which is Alan Stevens. A-L-A-N-S-E-V-E-N-S dot com dot A-U. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to have a look at any page, you know, if you want to find out about how somebody can help you, go and find out how they've helped other people. Yeah. So go to the tab on there, success stories, yep. and you go to the different categories in there of working with mental health, with parents, with school teachers, in business, uh, coach and training coaches. Go in and have a look there and you'll find plenty of uh, videos from all my clients talking about how they've, uh, how, what they've learned and how they've applied it. Fantastic. Well, Alan, thank you so much. That's been absolutely fantastic. Fascinating. And thank I'm going to be know. downloading that little, uh, or I'm going to be entering into that link where I get so many uh, messages every, every week for so many weeks to learn a bit more about how I read people. Uh, it's um, six in, six uh, emails, uh, two days apart over 11 days. Beautiful. Love it. Um, anything else you want to leave us with before we finish up? No, that's all. I just... Whenever you have like, this one thing with people, because of everything that's been happening, we're starting to think differently. And there's one thing that I've always, or two things I've led by. The first one was the most important thing I'll ever learn is the next thing I learn after I think I know everything. <laughs> so keep an inquisitive mind. You hear about something, don't just discount it. Go check it out. Yeah. Because the only person who loses if you don't do that is you. Absolutely. Couldn't agree. And the other thing is, especially at this time of uh, you know, the situation we're in, just remember that what you do with, uh, for yourself dies with you, but what you do for yourself, for others and for the universe isn't always will be eternal. I love that. Very, very nice. I love that. Thank you. Great message. Great message. Very spiritual as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and for all the uh, viewers and listeners out there, I hope that you found this as fascinating as I have. And uh, hopefully we might even get Alan back on to do another show. Love to. Um, but uh, my pleasure. So thanks again, Alan. I really appreciate it for coming in on a Friday. And for all the audience out there, have a great weekend. Thanks again for supporting us here at the uh, Suspended Animation Podcast. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. <laughs>